Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World videos. Now we are going to start a new part untitled Foundations of Macroeconomics. In the first chapter we are going to have a little focus on the scope of macroeconomics As we have already seen, microeconomics focuses on individual markets. It studies the demand for and supply of, for example, oranges, DVDs, petrol and haircuts, bricklays, yours, doctors, office, accommodation and computers. It examines the choices people make between goods and what determines their relative prices and the relative quantities produced. In macroeconomics, we take a much broader view. We examine the economy as a whole. We still examine demand and supply, but now it is the total level of spending in the economy and the total level of production. In other words, we examine aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We still examine output, employment and prices, but now it is national output and its rate of growth national employment and unemployment, and the general level of prices and their rates of increase, that is to say, the rate of inflation. In this chapter, I'm going to present the famous macroeconomic debates, the major macroeconomic issues, and the government macroeconomic policy. Let's get started. Macroeconomics examines various issues affecting whole economies. Many of these are the big issues on which elections are won or lost. Is the economy growing? And if so, how rapidly? How can we avoid recessions? What causes unemployment and how can the rate be got down? Why is inflation a problem? And what can be done to keep it at modest levels? What will happen to interest rates? And how big a problem is government debt? Are banks lending too much or too little? Well, if there were agreement about the answers to these questions, macroeconomics would be simpler, but less interesting. As it is, macroeconomics is often characterized by lively debate. Economists can take different views on the importance of macroeconomic issues, their causes, and the appropriate policy responses. Another factor is the difficulty to forecasting what will happen. It is relatively easy to explain things once they have happened. Few economists or anyone else foresaw the global banking crisis, credit crunch, and subsequent recession of 2007-2009. Even those who thought banks had too little capital and were making too many risks, loans could not predict exactly when a crisis would occur. A crucial element in macroeconomics activity is people's expectations. If people are optimistic about the future, consumers may be happy to go out and spend. Firms may be happy to invest. If they are pessimistic, spending is likely to fall. But what drives these expectations? Again, this is a topic of lively debate. Then, there is the political context. Governments may be unwilling to take unpopular measures, especially when an election looms. So, should they give responsibility for decisions to, the, to other bodies? In many countries, interest rates are not set by the government, but by central bank. In the United Kingdom, for example, it is the Bank of England that sets interest rates at the monthly meetings of the Monetary Policy Committee. So, just what are the macroeconomic issues that we will be studying in the following chapters? 
We can group them under the four main headings, economic growth, unemployment, inflation, and economic relationships between the rest of the, with the rest of the world. We will be studying other issues too. But let's focus on these macroeconomics issues. Let's get started and start with the economic growth. Governments try to achieve high rates of economic growth over the long term. In other words, growth that is sustained over the years and is not just a temporary phenomenon. To this end, governments also try to achieve stable growth, avoiding both recessions and excessive short-term growth that cannot be sustained, although governments are nevertheless sometimes happy to give the economy an excessive boost as an election drawn near. Economies suffer from inherent instability. As a result, economic growth and ma ma other macroeconomic indicators tend to fluctuate. The second issue is called unemployment. Reducing unemployment is another major macroeconomic aim of governments, not only for the sake of the unemployed themselves, but also because it represents a waste of time, of human resources, and because unemployment benefits are a drain on government revenues. What does unemployment mean? The number of employed, according to the economist's definition, those of working age who are without work, but who are available for work at current wage rates. The labor force is the number employed plus the number unemployed. And finally, the unemployment rate is the number unemployed expressed as a percentage of the labor force. For example, 2.5 divided by 28 plus 2.5 times 100 equals 8.2 percent. The third issue is related to inflation. By inflation we mean a general rise in prices throughout the economy. Government policy here is to keep inflation both low and stable. One of the most important reasons for this is that it will aid the process of economic decision-making. For example, businesses will be able to set prices and wage rates and make investment decisions with far more confidence. In recent years, we have tended to become used to inflation rates of around 2 or 3 percent, but it was not long ago that inflation in most developed countries was in double figures. Even though inflation rates rose in many countries in 2008 and again during 2010-2011, figures remained much lower than in the past. In 1975, the United Kingdom inflation reached 24%. During the recession of 2008-2009, inflation rates fell in most countries, becoming negative. We call that deflation in some. In most developed countries, governments have a particular target for the rate of inflation. In the United Kingdom, the target is 2%. The Bank of England then adjusts, adjusts interest rates to try to keep inflation on target. According to Crowther, inflation is state in which the value of money is falling and the prices are rising. In economics, the word inflation refers to general rise in prices measured against a standard level of purchasing power. There are several types of inflation, open inflation, the suppressed inflation, the galloping inflation, creeping inflation, and hyperinflation. As for the open inflation, here the rate where costs rise due to economic trends of spending, 
products and services. Concerning the suppressed inflation, existing inflation disguised by government price controls or other interferences in the economy, such as subsidies, such suppression nevertheless can only be temporary because no governmental measure can completely contain accelerating inflation in the long run. It is also called repressed inflation. As for the galloping inflation, it's a very rapid inflation which is almost impossible to reduce. Concerning the creeping inflation, circumstances where the inflation of a nation increases gradually but continually over time. This tends to be a typically pattern for many nations, although the increase is relatively small in the short term. As it continues over time, the effect will become greater and greater. Finally, hyperinflation is caused mainly by excessive deficit spending, financed by printing more money by a government. Some economists believe that social breakdown leads to hyperinflation, not vice versa, and that its roots lie in particular political rather than economic causes. Now, let's talk about and see how is inflation measured. There are two ways of measuring inflation. Consumer price index, the CPI, it's a measure of price changes in consumer goods and services such as gasoline, food, clothing and automobiles. The CPI measures price from change from the perspective of the purchaser and the PPI. The family of indexes that measure the, the average change over time in selling prices by domestic producers of goods and services. PPIs measure price change from the perspective of the seller. Now let's talk about the fourth main issue related to macroeconomics, which is the balance of payments and the exchange rate. The final issue so has to do with the country's foreign trade and its economic relationships with other countries. A country's balance of payment accounts records all transactions between the residents of that country and the rest of the world. These transactions enter as either debit items or credit items. The debit items include all payments to other countries. These include the country's purchases of imports, the investments it makes abroad and the interest and dividends paid to people abroad who have invested in the country. The credit items include all receipts from other in countries. These include the sales of exports, inflows of investment into the country and earnings of interest and dividends from abroad. The sale of exports and any other receipts earn foreign currency. The purchase of imports or any other payments abroad use up foreign currency. If we start to spend more foreign currency than we earn, one of the two things must happen. Both are likely to be a problem. The balance of payment will go into deficit. In other words, there will be a shortfall of foreign currencies. The government will therefore have to borrow money from abroad or draw on its foreign currency reserves to make up the shortfall. This is a problem because if it goes on too long, overseas debt will mount up along with the interest rate that must be paid and all reserves will begin to run low. The, or the exchange rate will fall. The exchange rate is the rate at which one currency exchanges for another. For example, the exchange rate of the pound into the dollar might be 1 euro equals 1.5 dollars. If the government does not does nothing to correct the balance of payment deficit, then the exchange rate must fall. The falling exchange rate is a problem because it pushes up the price of imports and may fuel inflation. Also, if the exchange rate fluctuates, this co can cause great uncertainty for traders and can damage international trade and economic growth. Eventually, let's talk about the macroeconomic 
policy from the above four issues we can identify four macroeconomic policy objectives that governments typically pursue high and stable economic growth low unemployment low inflation the avoidance of balance of payments deficits and excessive exchange rate fluctuations unfortunately these policy objectives may conflict for example, a policy designed to accelerate the rate of economic growth may result in a higher rate of inflation and a balance of payments deficit. Governments are thus often faced with awkward policy choices. In fact, societies face trade-offs between economic objectives. For example, the goal of faster growth may conflict with that of greater equality. The goal of lower unemployment may conflict with that of lower inflation, at least in the short run. This is an example of opportunity cost. The cost of achieving one objective may be achieving less of another. The existence of trade-offs means that policymakers must make choices. Now, let's sum up what we saw. We saw that macroeconomics, like microeconomics, looks at issues such as output, employment and prices, but it looks at them in the context of the whole economy. Macroeconomics is often characterized by debates. These debates arise because macroeconomic economists hold different views of how economies work. 3. The four main macroeconomic goals that are generally of most concern to governments are economic growth, reducing unemployment, reducing inflation, and avoiding balance of payments and exchange rate problems. Unfortunately, these goals are likely to conflict governments, may thus be faced with difficult policy choices. So this is the end of this video. The next video will be related to banking, money and interest rates. Thank you very much for your attention.